Hey guys, my name's Colin and this is Colin Talks Crypto. So Block One, true to their word, has launched the voice social media beta. This means real people sharing real content with accountability and the ability to monetize rewards. So first of all, I just wanted to cover this right off the bat. If you see some voice tokens land in your EOS account, I think pretty much all of us have been airdropped voice tokens. They're not really voice tokens. They are scam attempts. And I've already seen some people that have lost, like one guy lost 1100 EOS to this scam. And it blows my mind how we are still losing funds to stupid, stupid scams like this, but it is happening. So basically what happens is the scammers send voice tokens. It uses the same voice symbol and they include in the memo a website to visit. And if you go to that website and you perform any transactions, you are going to compromise your account most likely. So this is my public service announcement. Do not go to any websites on any memo that you see in your account. Also, I just want to take this moment to ask all creators of blockchain explorers and wallets for EOS to implement a feature if you haven't already, whereby if there is a website URL present inside of a memo to make very clear that it is a possible scam on that transaction, especially with specifically with incoming token transfers, because that is how scammers do it. They send you a token, they call it something, they put a memo and they say, claim your POS, claim your Telos, claim your voice here, and they give you some URL, and then they scam you out of your tokens or your whole account, often by having you perform a transaction that changes the key pair for the owner and active keys on your account. And then you just lost your entire account. So first of all, to all the token holders, do not go to websites from memos and all voice tokens are scams because voice isn't even running on the US mainnet. So how can they be sending you tokens? Just a little logical uh, test there. And secondly, for block explorer creators and wallets, um, please make it very clear that incoming tokens that include a memo that ask a user to go somewhere are very likely to be a scam. In fact, I would give it you know a 99% odds Maybe there's some legitimate use of it, but it's mostly for scammers. So I hope this saves you guys from being tricked. Do not try to get voice tokens on US right now. It's a beta, not even running on the US blockchain. It is impossible for you to get voice tokens. So don't even try. Okay, so with that being said, we're gonna dive right in here to the main video. I wanna start off by just giving a big thanks to Bitgenstein. You can see him on the screen here. He released a couple of videos um, portraying the voice platform. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna talk about this and I made some notes. I'll flip to full screen mode here. And I'm just gonna read you my notes and I'll show you this video footage here of the beta voice social media platform so you can get an idea and a feel for what it looks like. Keep in mind this is beta and it could change considerably. So as you can see, it's got a very clean, crisp and modern interface. And I've read from some users that they feel it resembles Medium in a way, medium.com. And I have to agree, it's got that clean look that Medium has. It looks very much like what we would expect a modern social media platform to look like. So it's sort of like Medium with tokens and weighted posts and monetization kind of all wrapped in one. So it looks pretty cool from the start. Block One has been working on this for a very, very long time. Based on the simplicity of what we see, I have a feeling that a lot of what they were working on was legal things behind the scenes, ensuring that the token was legitimate under US law, that they weren't gonna be accused of having a security and making sure that US citizens had a way to participate. Because if I recall correctly, maybe I have this wrong, but I recall a while back thinking that US citizens were going to be the ones exempted from using the voice social platform. And that was back, you know, six plus months ago, back when they talked about the biometric user, unique ID. And um, I think what happened, and this is my speculation, is that Block One realized that they can't exempt the United States from such a undertaking because of the number of people. There's just too many people 
and America is too much in the internet age to just not include invoice. So they took a different route. Again, my speculation on that, but they, they took the route of KYC and you have to verify using a driver's license or other identification. And it's a fairly quick process, but you get verified within five minutes or an hour and then you use the service and you use your name as it's written on your driver's license. And when you've verified in that manner, only then can you receive tokens, the voice tokens. Right now, of course, these voice tokens are running on the test net network for all intents and purposes. Voice is essentially running on a test net maintained by Block One themselves. And they've said that as they get this finalized and they've fixed all the bugs and it's ready to roll out officially, they can do so on a public blockchain such as EOS and maybe other EOS IO blockchains as well. It may depend on how much resources they need. You know, it really brings to mind liquid apps and I feel like they should leverage liquid apps to leverage the resources among all the blockchains. And why not? That would just showcase the power of EOS and liquid apps simultaneously. And from what I understand, Liquid Apps is more than capable of such an undertaking. But that is just a little side note there. And the reason that Block One has chosen to run their beta on a purpose-made centralized instance of the EOS IO blockchain is for iteration, for speed of iteration, because they can fix bugs, deploy it rapidly, inexpensively, and really just the sake of speed, of getting this thing up and running and adding features with the utmost of speed. So we're going to cut down on development time by them using their own testnet, and then it's going to migrate in its more finished form onto the main net. So with that introduction, I want to cover what voice is and what voice is not, because I think that there are some misconceptions. I know that I went through a learning phase and learning process on really grasping what they're trying to accomplish here. And I feel like I have a better understanding, especially after some messages back and forth with Brendan Bloomer, the CEO of Block One. I think I've gained a better understanding of what they're trying to accomplish here. And it didn't totally align with my original vision. And so I had to just make a mental adjustment. Okay, you know, it's not a, it's kind of like B, or it's a hybrid of A and B. So what is voice? Well, voice is a social media platform that allows you to have unique verified users as real individual people. This means real people sharing real content with accountability and the ability to monetize rewards. I would say that that summarizes my opinion of what voice is. Now, what is voice not? It's not censorship free. It is not the type of platform that a whistleblower could use, for example. Illegal content cannot be shared on voice. And I have nothing wrong with that, but I didn't know that the platform was not going to be censorship free. I, I guess I just assumed that because it's utilizing a blockchain, that would be part of their goals. I mean, that sort of innately goes with blockchain, right? Like the reason that we use blockchain whether it's for transference of money and value or a smart contract or a social media site, you'd think is, is to have immutability and to have censorship resistance. And it's not quite the case with this platform. So to me, that was a misconception that I had. I don't know if you guys shared that as well, but that was something that I had to kind of, you know, get over that mental hurdle for. Now, with that being said, there are still many positive things that voice is bringing to the table. This whole unique users, verified users is a big deal. No other social media platform has that. Facebook doesn't have that. Twitter doesn't have that. Telegram doesn't have that. And what do we have on all those platforms? We have information rife with unaccountability. It could be false because no one has to face up to it. Um, we have manipulation. We have botnets, botnets, you know, groups of computers or uh, farms with people in them. China farming where they have a thousand iPads or iPhones and they click on a button to upvote or downvote because they got paid by someone who has money to promote their cause and essentially creating a artificial grassroots movement through fake upvotes, fake downvotes and fake people. And so by having unique verified users, this is going to grossly reduce, if not almost, I would say almost entirely, nothing's 100%. But, you know, because you'd always have someone who sells their account or something like that, sells their voice account after they verify it. That could definitely be a thing on the black market, right? 
I just thought of that right now, but I could see that being a thing. But I would say it grossly, like 99% reduces the ability for civil attacks and farming upvotes and downvotes and trying to sway uh, consensus in social media and that sort of thing. And so even though voice is not censorship free, it still does bring value. And that's my point here. And so that's my summary of what voice is and my summary of what voice is not. And I'm just going to read you something that I wrote here last night. I see voice as an improvement to some aspects of existing social media. The big question is, are these partial improvements enough to onboard enough users to gain a significant market share in comparison to other social media platforms such as Facebook? I think it has a chance to gain such levels of network effect due to its monetization for content creators and the pure content it offers to content consumers. Pure meaning unmanipulable and accountable. But it could realistically take some time, like five to 10 years, if it happens at all. There's no guarantee that voice will become the next Facebook, but there is a chance and it is definitely doing something different. So innovation could breed success and we will have to see. Now, one of the downsides, depending on your viewpoint on this, is that you must identify yourself with the KYC process. That's also the upside of ensuring unique users. And later in this video, I will talk about biometric ID and how that could have or may play into the voice social network as well. So you have to identify yourself with the KYC process and essentially submit yourself to government oversight of your every communication on the platform. KYC does add several forms of friction to the sign-up process, so that's a negative. For example, it takes you know five minutes or 60 minutes or however long to get verified. That's a little form of friction, not a deal breaker. And secondly, giving up one's full rights to the KYC process because you are submitting your complete identification so if you say anything on this platform, the government knows who it was without a doubt. And so I would say those are the two kind of frictions. One's a time friction and one sort of a philosophical friction, whether you agree with signing up with something like that or not. And I think some people don't care and they're just going to sign up like that. And some people are definitely going to give it some serious thought. And some people may be dissuaded entirely based on their ideas and their philosophies on the subject of KYC being involved with their social media. So those are the two types of friction that I can see being involved here with the KYC aspect. But again, they're doing something different. And to do something different, you have to try new things. And so they are definitely doing that. Due to these frictions, which competitors such as Facebook don't have, the benefit that voice offers must outweigh this friction. The KYC process unfortunately was necessary for the route that Block One chose to take in order to be able to issue the voice token and still maintain control over and manage the platform because they do want to make sure that it doesn't have illegal material on it. And they do want to make sure that they can moderate it. But the trade-off for these levers of control is centralization and government can step in. So it's a trade-off here. So the benefit that voice offers must outweigh these negatives for people to onboard themselves. Otherwise, they may not feel it's worth it. In this regard, due to its central point of control, voice must meet many of the same content standards that other centralized services such as Facebook must meet. This is in terms of violence or pornography or things of that nature, hostility, but um, it can be a controversial subject. And at the end of the day, someone has to be that arbiter making that judgment call. And my philosophy on the subject here, just to take a side note, is that the entire reason we got into the blockchain space was because we found that money was not entrustable under people's control due to greed and misuse. And I feel that information is the same way. People find ways to abuse it and misuse it um, just like we talked about with Sybil attacking, botnets, um, farming, upvotes, downvotes, creating fake grassroots movements. These are all examples of not being able to entrust information with humans. And so ultimately what I would like to see would be a social media network that is fully decentralized 
and also utilizes a form of biometric user identification so that we know there's real humans involved, but there's not that moderator step. So like BitTorrent, the government, even though they want to stop it, they couldn't. And that's the future I'd like to see. And perhaps voice is a stepping stone on the way to that ultimate social media future. But in the meantime, voice does make advances in that direction. And I will get into some of the ways that the blockchain is being used. It's not just a Facebook replica with KYC. The metadata is stored on the blockchain. And as Dan pointed out correctly, this enables timestamps and this enables a record, a log of changes. And that's something we don't have on other platforms like Facebook, Twitter, etc. You know, if something gets deleted, it's often deleted forever. There's no record. Or if something gets edited, you don't know that necessarily. It depends on if the platform chooses to show that to you. But because the metadata, you know, not the data itself, not the message, not the article, not the post, not the content, but the the data surrounding it, like the hash and the timestamp, that looks like that will be stored in the blockchain. And by doing so, that creates a trail and a record and accountability, another level of accountability. It's not true censorship resistance, but it's some level of accountability. So at least if something gets deleted or removed or edited, even if you don't know what it was because it was removed, you do know that it was removed. And that's a step up knowing that it was taken down. So the silencing of opinions can be done, but it can only be done with full public knowledge of it being done. So it's a step in the right direction. However, as mentioned earlier, censorship, resistance, and immutability is not one of the goals of voice. Its advancements come in other areas, such as records of changes to entries with timestamps, auditable database, user accountability for content, and non-manipulation of data through civil attacks. These are the many advancements that voice does bring to the table. These are voice's strengths. Censorship resistance in its traditional sense is not part of this feature set. And I saw a user ask a question, if content is removable, then what's the incentive for users to sign up? How does voice overcome Facebook's network effect? What incentive does someone have to sign up when their friends and families are already signed up on Facebook and other platforms instead? It's quite a hurdle for voice to overcome. It's that initial network effect. And the answer lies in the voice token. This will enable monetization of content for content creators. This is in direct opposition to Facebook's method where they steal the value you create on their platform. And this goes for almost every other platform. You're creating the interest, the content on that platform, and that's why people go. Imagine if there was no posts on Facebook. Do you know how much people would pay to advertise on it? Zero. So by making interesting posts and putting pictures of your cat, you are creating the value that then Facebook extracts from you and pockets for themselves. And this is where I think voice has its inroads. When voice exits beta and the real voice token lands on exchanges, it will have a value. And this is how I see it panning out in this sequence. This will first encourage content creators to jump on board. After more and more content creators have signed up, Regular users will follow as they want to view the content. And that's the sequence I see unfolding. That's what Block One has alluded to in the past as well. So obviously, it's a chicken and egg problem. And if there was no incentivization, no users are going to jump on board just for the sake of using voice on the US blockchain. Like, no one really cares. In the mainstream, you know, of course, there's the nerds of us, the inner EOS niche nerd circle that do care. But it doesn't mean anything if the broader mainstream audience isn't enticed to jump on board. So what's going to entice them? Well, having their favorite social media creators and content creators and video creators and articles on the voice platform, that is going to entice them. Imagine if PewDiePie moved to voice network because he makes 10 million a year in voice tokens. That's going to bring all of his followers or many of them onto the voice network just to view his content. And when they're on the network, it has the Metcalf's law effect, whereby their friends then want to interact with their other friends who are following PewDiePie. And eventually you have Elon Musk joins the platform, and then his followers join. And then you have people who want to follow 
PewDiePie and or Elon Musk joining the platform, and then their families join, and and so on, and avalanches. And that's how I see it realistically playing out. And the value of the voice token is at the heart of that equation. So I realize this video is getting a bit long, and I'm just going to finish up with some questions that I wrote here and answer them as well. So again, if you see voice tokens in your EOS account, they are fake, they are a scam, do not follow any link attached as a memo to any voice tokens received on your EOS accounts, because voice isn't even running on the EOS mainnet yet. And even if it was, just don't follow links in memo fields. That's just a bad practice. Another aspect of how voice works is that when you have voice tokens, you're able to put up content. And you're able to kind of like pin that content to the top so that other people will see it. But to do so, to promote it like that, you have to spend your voice tokens. And that's fine because what you're getting in exchange for your voice tokens is exposure. And if someone else wants to pin their content over yours, they can do so, but they have to spend more voice tokens than you spent. And so while you lose your advertising spot, you actually get paid to be pushed out. You receive more tokens than you spent. So it incentivizes both parties. You have whoever wants their voice to be heard the loudest can pay for it to be heard the loudest. Another topic I want to cover, as I mentioned earlier, was biometric unique ID. About six months ago, we came across some patents. A shout out to Zach from Everything EOS. I think he was the one to discover the patents on this. But basically what was found was two patents by Block One. One for a social media network and one for a unique user ID. And basically the summary of this was the biometric user ID was a sidestep to KYC. And that's why this whole time I've kind of been expecting this biometric solution. And I was sort of surprised when I heard that it was just going to be KYC only and there was going to be no biometric solution involved whatsoever. And again, I think that's due to the unfortunate legislative nature of our country regulating everything into a whole. But that resulted in biometric unique ID not being present on the current, at least, iteration of the voice network. It's not to say that it couldn't be added down the road, and I hope that it is. But honestly, at least in USA, I can't see the United States saying, oh, you know what, it's fine if you want to use biometric user ID instead of KYC, and um, we still won't consider you a security. I think that probably the way that it'll work is block one has to do whatever governments are saying while they wish to maintain control over the social media platform. So the biometric unique ID was really cool though. And to just briefly touch upon what it did is it allowed you to use your phone to capture various uh, perceptions about each user. That included a picture of the face. It included a 3D scan of the face with the biometric uh, scanning technology on most smartphones these days. It included even recording signals in the nearby area, you know, which Wi-Fi networks were present, which Bluetooth networks were present, uh, GPS data, and lastly, the other people in the photos that you take, their faces and their unique IDs and biometric IDs as well. And by building up a network, it was a trust network, you could essentially prove that you are a unique person along with the other people around you backing that up. And it required no KYC. And I just think that was so utterly brilliant. And I really do hope that we see the light of day on that. But uh, at least right now, it is not present in voice. And I don't know if it ever will be. But let's keep encouraging them to do that. Maybe in some countries, it will be enough and they will allow that. You know, that'd be great. And so another question is, what about other countries? Right now, voice only is rolling out in the USA. And it's really tricky for them the way they've got this. You know, they're doing this in a very follow the law manner, but that makes it really tough because for every country and every jurisdiction, there's a new set of laws to adhere to. And that means that block one essentially has to become a legal expert in every jurisdiction for every area of the earth that voice gets released on. That's a humongous undertaking, very resource intensive. Imagine all the different experts and lawyers and legal experts and moderators that you have to have maintaining such a network. And that's when I asked on Twitter, is this scalable? And how scalable is this? I mean, if we have a billion users in 150 countries, how many moderators and legal experts are we going to require for that? Is that even sustainable? 
And it just reminded me of the U.S. original constitution and how it wasn't sustainable. The ECAF was not scalable. And uh, I just, I wonder how scalable this is. So again, this is a big experiment and time will tell. And we will see if it's possible to scale moderation and legal adherence to many jurisdictions globally. And the payment is going to have to be with the profits from the voice token, unless Blockone wants to dip into their own coffers, which I don't think makes business sense. I imagine the voice venture is expected to pay for itself with the 10% of inflation that Block One gets every year with voice tokens. So I imagine they're paying for everything with that 10% of inflation. Will it be enough to fund the global adoption amongst all countries? I don't know. And if it is enough, then the voice token must be worth a hell of a lot. And that's the upside. Maybe as it becomes adopted more globally, the rewards and the value of the voice token will go up and up and up, and it will have a snowball effect and increasingly capture the minds and the content of content creators globally. So I could see it snowballing in that regard, but it's uncertain at this time. It could go a lot of directions. And Block One recently released a code of rules, the rules of voice, and it's quite extensive. As other users pointed out, it's not much different than the code of conduct or rules that Facebook or Twitter or Reddit employ. And so in that regard, again, we're not trying to be a decentralized, immutable, censorship-free platform. Voice is a platform that follows rules and conduct and the law. And so if you want to take a look at it, I'll scroll down here on the screen for you while I'm talking, but you can see that it's quite extensive. It's quite thorough. They tried to make it simple, but... In the end, it's going to be a challenge, in my opinion, to enforce this globally, especially when you have a lot of, it's arbitrary. You know, sometimes one person might think that some content or post is unacceptable and an, another person might not. And that depends on the moderator. So again, this is not censorship free in that regard. And it says things like threats and um, abusive language will not be tolerated and hostile behavior will not be tolerated. I mean, if you go on Twitter, you see people calling people shit coiners, or you go on Reddit, you see that term all over the place. And will that be deemed name calling, hostile or toxic or threatening behavior? It may very well be. And um, I'm just not sure how that's scalable. I guess it's, it's nice. It sets it up for like this utopian world where whether it's realistic or not, I'm not sure, but it sets up for this utopian world where everyone's upheld to some level of decency and discussing with each other on pleasant terms. It's okay to disagree, but you have to disagree in an amicable fashion. So it'll be interesting. Um, I've seen everything from the term thought police thrown at this concept to you know a great groundbreaking idea. So again, big experiment here. The CEO of Voice, I think his name is Sala, said that part of his expectation is because users have KYC verified, have their picture up, have their real name up, he expects that there will be less desire for toxicity, essentially. And I could see that being the case because when you hide behind a pseudonym, you can say anything, but when you put your face out there and you put your name out there, you're a real person. And the things you say suddenly matter, just in the same way that when you walk up to someone in the store or on the street and you shake their hand and say hi to them, you're probably not going to just go up to them and say, hey, shit coiner, I see that you hold EOS. What's that going to get you in real life? It might get you decked in the face. It's going to definitely make you a social outcast. And so I think he could be right that it may be easier to moderate this kind of a platform than others because we do have verified users. And that was an interesting point of view that I think does have some merit. And final thoughts here, this is a beta. I can't stress that enough. Anything can change. Block One's running it, not on EOS right now, but on their own purpose-made blockchain. So they're doing that for the sake of speed of iteration. I would take a guess that they'll still be tweaking this and perfecting it and adding features on the testnet for up to a year. I think that uh, people might expect it to be faster, but I think that Block One is really setting this up for the long run and they want to get it right. So this is a beta, this is a beta, this is a beta. And it's important to know that a lot of things can change over time. So to summarize the bottom line, voice is an improvement to some aspects of existing social media problems. And it's also an experiment. 
please comment below what you feel about the social media platform created by Block One. Please like, share, subscribe, and thank you very much for watching this. Have a great day. Thank you.